Hey everybody, today we have Kurt Bonham, a professional working actor slash multimedia performer, uh, and he caught the acting bug in fifth grade. Uh, he does film and television work, musical theater, Shakespeare, cabaret, and a lot of other stuff, especially audio book productions, which is something I'm looking forward to chatting about today. So uh, Kurt, thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely, glad to be here. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to go a little bit more detail. Tell us a little bit about your work, um, you know, explain to us how you got into this and also talk a bit about like how you sort of transitioned into what you're doing now with the audiobooks and how that's been helpful for your acting career. Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, yeah, uh, like you said, I, I started in the fifth grade. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and we happen to have a really good children's theater uh, program in my town. And um, my dad was a bit of a performer. He sang barbershop, um, you know, uh, four part harmony stuff, it, which was really interesting because he's a, a businessman and, and, and you wouldn't think of him that way, but he actually was also a musician, taught me how to play piano. Uh, I sang a little bit with, with his chorus. And then in the fifth grade, I auditioned for a play at the local children's theater and I got in the chorus of Cinderella and um, I, I will always remember opening night, the curtain call, I came out on stage to the audience applauding and uh, that was it. Like I knew right then that that was what I wanted to do and it, that has never stopped. From that moment on, I auditioned for every play. Um, I've generally been performing in some fashion, um, almost nonstop ever since, since that moment in the fifth grade. Uh, whether it's been plays or in choir or uh, bands or uh, juggling uh, magic comedy. I, I also was a professional juggler for, for a little while, um, juggling ch uh, junior national juggling champion even. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a whole other part of my performing career uh, in my latter high school days. I did a lot of Renaissance fairs and um, theme parks and parties and comedy clubs and street performing and stuff like that with the juggling. Um, and uh, so I grew just grew up doing doing theater really is the main thing I did. Um, lots of musical theater and a little bit of everything. And then I moved to Los Angeles after I graduated high school and went to Cal State Northridge. And I started as a film major, though I was in the same building as the theater department and I was taking theater. And I was, I think the day I got to Los Angeles, I auditioned for the first play at my at Cal State Northridge for that year. And I got into that. And I eventually changed over to being just a theater major after about a year and a half, realizing that I was doing film production, which basically takes up all of your time. And I was doing plays, which basically takes up all of your extra time. So I had to, had to decide exactly which I was going to focus on. And acting was always my, my passion. So switched over to uh, theater. And um, my sister had actually, she's seven years older, and she had moved to California before me, some years before she went to college in San Jose and she studied um, at the time, I think it was called like RTVF, like radio TV film communications. And so she majored in that and ended up getting into the film industry on the production side. Uh, she's now a very big uh, location manager. And uh, so she's been doing that for 30 plus years. So she was already there. She moved down to, to Los Angeles as well. And I had visited a couple times as a teenager and loved it. And um, so, you know, went out for college. And uh, after college, just, you know, kept going. And um, I've done, you know, some commercial work, some TV work, a little film work here and there. Um, I recently, uh, almost a year ago now, it's getting close, uh, moved to Atlanta after 30 years in Los Angeles, uh, specifically to follow the film industry. Once again, my sister was the first. She moved here about four years ago. She was working on um, the, the A&E television show, Halt and Catch Fire. 
and uh, she did like six months here and then went back to LA and then came back for season two and decided that was it. She was done with LA. She liked Atlanta and there was tons of work here. Uh, so she moved here and then uh, about a year ago, my fiance and I uh, moved out, uh, followed her here and so did my parents. So now we have the whole family here, which is great. And, um, and that's been a really great move. Um, the, there, there's more filmed in Atlanta and the Southeastern region now than any place else in the world. So it's sort of become a second Hollywood really, or the first Hollywood there, since there's, there's more filmed here. And, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really great. Uh, I love my agents here and I've been auditioning for a ton of stuff, frankly, a lot more than I ever did in Los Angeles, uh, which has been really, really interesting. I've in the year here, I have auditioned for probably more and better stuff than I did in 30 years in Los Angeles. So it's just sort of a whole different scene. Um, uh, as well as right before I moved about, I don't know, four, five, six months before I moved, I started getting into the voiceover stuff and audiobooks in particular, which was uh, sort of my parents doing really. I had been, I'd always been interested in it. It, it always seemed like it would be a really cool part of the business to get into, but there'd always been this feeling in LA, especially that the voiceover world was really hard to break into that, you know, it's this small group of people and, you know, it's really tough to break into. And, and at that time too, we didn't have what I have here now, which is a home studio. Very few people had those, you know, back in the, you know, early mid nineties, even into the early 2000s when it was sort of starting to pick up that way. So it was a lot harder, you know, you, you, to, you couldn't really do anything on your own. It was a lot more difficult and the industry was very different. It was all very much run by, you know, you needed that, a, you know, you needed an agent and you were, you know, it was commercial work and all that kind of stuff. Now the voiceover industry is really expanded. There's just, there's tons of work that you can get working from your home studios, which are much easier to set up and, and manage. Um, and there's all kinds of work you can find online and as well as finding your own, finding clients on your own. Um, that world has really expanded. And then audiobooks, um, that was really how I transitioned. Uh, my parents were big audiobook listeners for a long time. I remember my mom having cassettes in the car way, way back in the day and uh, listening to stuff on trips. So I had a friend, uh, his name's Chuck Constant in Los Angeles that I'd done a play with. And I kept seeing him post on Facebook about how Oh, it's his 11th book he's doing of the year, audio book of the year and, and stuff. And I thought, oh, that's, I should talk to him about that. And I happened to mention that to my folks and they said, yes, you should talk to him about that. Do that. And then I didn't. <laughs> and, and a year went by and it came up again in another conversation with my parents. I said, oh, I saw my friend Chuck again. He posted again about all these audio books he's been doing. And my parents said, oh, you, you talk to him about that? I said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it, I promise. And they, and they actually said, uh, you know, we, we really think you would be great at this with your, your experience as a, a, as a theater actor and you do all these voices and you have a great voice and I, we just think you'd be great at this, so look into it. And they even said, if you need help, like getting equipment or setting yourself up, like, we'll, we'll help you with that. We, we just, we'd love to see you try this. Yeah. I went, well, oh, all right, well, I guess I should do that. And uh, so I, it was actually over a Christmas break and my fiance had uh, gone back to visit her mom in New York. So I was all alone at our house and I just kind of did it. I, by the time she got back, I had set up um, a whole like booth in our spare bedroom, which was sort of my office um, using some tri-folding screens and our mutual friend, Jay Warner hooked me up with the person who was doing the music for your movie Dakota, uh, he had a whole bunch of acoustic foam just sitting around in storage that he didn't want. So he gave me all that. Um, <laughs> I got a microphone and a, and a, and an interface for my computer and set this whole deal up. 
and did a whole bunch of research online about the audiobook world um, and found out about uh, this site, acx.com, which is the uh, audio creation exchange, which is Audible's um, website where they connect uh, narrators with independent authors. So it's, it's sort of like a, it's a free casting site for audiobooks for independent authors. You know, it doesn't cost anything. You can set up a profile on there, put up samples, and you can start auditioning for books or authors might contact you. And uh, so I like sort of deep dive, did a deep dive research on the audiobook world, uh, learned as much as I could, figured out how to record, get it to the ACX specs. And then I also set up a, a lunch meeting with my friend Chuck and uh, sort of discussed it with him, found out, you know, how he got into it and what it entailed and, uh, and put up a sample. And the day after I put up a sample on, on ACX, I was contacted by somebody who um, ran a company that uh, sort of he was almost like an agent, but he wasn't an agent. What he did was uh, he would he would find books that were up for royalty share, which is where um, you you uh, you share the, the royalties 50 50 with the author or the, the rights holder, whoever it is. Uh, so you don't you don't make money in, unless the book makes money. Um, and there's a lot of those on ACX. Um, but he would take those. And then he would get, he had a stable of narrators and then he would, you know, figure out the right narrator for the book. And then he would actually pay the narrator instead of doing the royalty share for the narrator, he would out of pocket pay the narrator what's called a per finished hour rate, which you get paid per the, you know, finished hour of audiobook. So if it comes out to 10 hours, you know, it, and your rate is, you know, $150, let's say, then, you know, it's $1,500. Um, which was a really, it was a really great way to sort of, you know, I, I dove right in the deep end. I immediately started doing books um, and he just kept sending me them. Uh, so I, I sort of started doing it almost full time right away. And it was a really intense learning experience, mm -hmm. um, but I fell in love with it right off the bat. Uh, I really enjoyed the work, um, you know, it fulfilled a lot of what I love to do as an actor, which is do a bunch of character work. You know, I got to do these books where you play every part. Yeah. <laughs> Accents and, you know, character voices or what, you know, depending on the genre, there's, there's different genres and styles uh, with the audio books. Um, and I sort of found myself, uh, my need to be on stage sort of faded away. Uh, you know, I, I normally had a, had a real itch to always be doing something on stage and uh, that sort of faded away and I was just really enjoying doing the audiobooks, and um, and so I just really dove into that um, along with I started doing some other voiceover uh, coaching uh, for commercials and animation and various other, you know, areas, genres of voiceover work in general and started sort of turning my focus towards voiceover work as a whole and audiobooks specifically. And uh, in that first year, I did 20 books. Um, and then this is now, I've, it's been about a year and a half that I've been doing this. And uh, I just had my 30, 32nd or 33rd book released. I have a couple more about to come out. Uh, I just did my first book for a major publisher, which was a, a big goal of mine um, for this year. And uh, it's really become my full-time job. I'm hoping that keeps up. You know, it, at this point, it's still like any, you know, independent contractor work, uh, acting work. You know, you're constantly looking for the next job. Um, so I'm still auditioning and, uh, you know, hoping that the the work with this publisher keeps up and... And then I just got to keep doing the marketing and, and uh, you know, pushing forward. Uh, there's, there's a lot of work to do and um, it's sort of never ending, but I'm enjoying it and I love being in my, in my booth. So uh, I guess that's sort of my, 
my general origin story. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. It's very, uh, <laughs> it sounds like A, you love what you do. B, it's convenient and fun for you and, and easy to do. It's not, you know, like audiobooks are awesome because you can do it from the comfort of your own home if you have a studio. Um, and that's key though, is that you really, really enjoy it, you know, because some actors out there, like I don't want, if, if, if you're an actor listening to this right now and you're thinking, ooh, audiobooks are a way for me to make a quick buck, it's like, think about it carefully because if you don't like doing it, it is actually a lot of work to kind of get the ball rolling. There's, really a, gr the there's a great video by this guy, Sean Allen Pratt, who's one of the sort of foremost audiobook narrators. Um, he's been doing it for, you know, a long time he has probably a thousand books to his name and he has a video called um i think it's called so you so you want to be an audiobook narrator or so you want to be a narrator it's it's one of those and it's one of these videos that all, everybody in the industry when somebody jumps in and says hey i really i'm really interested in this you know um what what should i do everybody points him to this video and basically what it is is he says okay start find a book you like, set up a light or something in a, in like your closet in some sort of small space, mm -hmm. set up a light. And then every day for a week, go in there and read out loud for four hours. And every time you make a mistake, stop and go back to the beginning of that sentence. Every time you find a word that you don't know how to pronounce or you don't know what it means, stop and look it up. And if after five days of doing that, you still want to do it, all right, then move forward. But it is, it's a, it is not for the faint of heart. It's a very specific genre of audio work that a lot of people in the regular VO world have no interest in doing. It is, you know, it's a long form audio. And while it can pay very well, um, you can make a really good living at it it is the lowest paid for the most amount of work in the voiceover world. Mm -hmm. So it definitely has to be a little bit of a passion. It also happens to be, I think, the easiest area to break into in voiceover. Yeah. There is, um, audiobooks are the largest growing, I think they're actually the only growing segment of the publishing world. Because, uh, uh, you know, print media has been dying off and audiobooks just keep growing and growing and growing and every year it's like exponential growth and they don't see that stopping at all the sort of audio medium in general is really popular and so there's a ton of people that want their books made into audio and it's sort of become a thing now you know it used to be like audio books i mean books on tape what you know people didn't really think about it much and now if you're an author that's sort of needs to become part of your marketing plan is to have audio. So there's, there's more books than there are narrators. Um, not all of them necessarily pay a lot. Um, they might be royalty share. And if they don't sell, then you don't make any money. Um, and that's a whole trick in itself and picking decent royalty share titles. Um, but you can do it on your own. The fact that there's ACX and it's free and you can just put your stuff up and start auditioning. You don't need an, a there are no agents actually for audiobooks. I think unless you're a celebrity, which there are plenty of celebrities that are doing audiobooks now, I imagine they probably work through their agent to make their deals. But other than that, even the biggest audiobook narrators in the business, they don't have agents for this. It's either self-generated. Well, I mean, it's really, it's all self-generated. Yeah. And um, it's, it's really about marketing yourself, building the skills. It's definitely, you know, takes talent and, and um, you know, you have to have the right set of skills for it. But if you do and you're persistent, there's no reason you can't make, make money doing this. And potentially, you know, I, I just had my best month. Um, I won't say exactly what it was, but it was really, really good. Um, and lots of my friends now. The other thing to note is the audiobook world and voiceover world in general is awesome. It's just the best people. It's the most supportive community in the entertainment industry I've ever encountered. Um, I think because we all sit in our boxes and are like isolated doing these strange things 
there's a, just a lot of camaraderie. Yeah. And there's a strange lack of competitiveness in it. It's, it's really supportive. People don't feel like they're competing with each other. Um, the, the sort of the attitude in the voiceover world is there's enough work for everybody. So you, you, everybody has a unique voice and things they can do, and there's plenty of work for everybody. So it's just, it's really super supportive. People are always helping out. And even myself now, I've, I've helped several of my friends start getting into audiobooks or voiceover. Um, I'm constantly like fielding questions from new people that just contact me out of the blue. They're like, Hey, I'm interested. I see you do this, you know? And you know, I love talking about it and I like helping out and, and there's just sort of this sense in the voiceover community of wanting to give back because it's such a supportive community. So um, there's just a lot to, to like about it. And I'm really happy that I, I found this, um, even though I'm still pursuing theater and film and I'm auditioning all the time. I have two auditions. I have uh, on camera auditions. I have to set up for today later. Um, I think it's also taken a lot of pressure off of that side of the business about doing on camera work because I know I have this actual, like I'm making money, I'm making a living doing this other thing that I love to do already. Yeah. So makes a, there's a lot less desperation to like get that commercial or book that TV show or something, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, it's been a really, really interesting journey going, coming all this way. I, w I wish I had started it a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> honestly um but i'm glad i finally found it now yeah awesome um well i have a number of questions and stuff that i wrote down while you were talking about all of this um my first question is just a, a very quick one now you had mentioned that there's sort of like two different ways that generally that actors can get paid for audiobooks one is sort of like a profit share thing and the other one is just getting paid out right like an yeah. hour finished um so uh when actors are sort of starting out, they're typically probably going to be what, like doing the profit share one um, first or, and then they go. That's to very common. Yeah. I mean, that is a very common way uh, that people get started in audiobooks is by doing, it's called royalty share or RS. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a, there's probably thousands of those titles uh, on ACX available to audition for. Um, it is the majority of the work on ACX is royalty share. And um, it's, uh, it's interesting because it, it's not bad. There's nothing bad about it. But of course, you know, not every book is going to be a winner. Yeah. And probably the majority of them aren't. So, um, but it, the fact is, is it's, it's easier to land those gigs because there are so many and there is, there's less competition for those titles and not as many people will be auditioning for them um, and not as many experienced narrators will be auditioning for them. So it, it, it's, a, it's an easy way to start building your portfolio is by, you know, finding at least royalty share titles that you would enjoy doing even if it doesn't look like it's going to be a seller doesn't yeah. mean it's a bad book there's plenty of really great books that for any number of reasons don't sell a lot of it has to do with well one there's just a lot of books <laughs> so it takes a lot of skilled marketing to to be successful so yeah. that's one of the things you look into when you're when you're really if you're not just looking to do it um, sort of as a hobby or to just build your portfolio at first if you're really looking to do royalty shares to make money. Um, I mean, no matter how successful the book, it's probably not going to, you know, make a ton of money immediately in the first place. Um, not to say it can't. Uh, I know plenty of narrators who will do royalty shares sort of in between their other paying work when yeah. they have some time they'll 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 pop one in and there's ways to find good ones you mm -hmm. know based on various criteria like their amazon rankings um the ebook sales you know you can ask the authors say hey i wonder you know if you have sales records um 
whatever what their marketing plan is you know if they have a big following online or or Same. elsewhere you know so there's sort of all this stuff you can put together to go i think that might that book might do well yeah. and there are plenty of narrators who who make their monthly nut just from their royalties um it, so it's it's sort of it's the way to make passive income in uh in audiobooks it's not necessarily the way to make quick or a lot of money um, that takes time. So that, that's royalty share, but yes, good way to get, to get started. Um, you can absolutely build a portfolio doing royalty share titles. Most people I know that get into this fairly quickly can book one. Um, Cause like I said, there's just a ton of them waiting out there. Um, and uh I just, I just did my very first one. I, I was sort of lucky that I was getting paid right away um, and I didn't have to do any royalty shares. Um, but I just did my first one. It just came out on the 4th of July, actually. And um, that author had contacted me through ACX and I looked at the title and I saw it had a really great Amazon ranking. Um, it's in a genre, a a, it's in a sub genre of romance, which is the best selling r romance is the best selling genre of in audiobooks. It's massive. It's a massive industry. Um, and I looked at her other books and it looked like they all were selling well, great reviews. And I thought, okay, that, that looks like it could be a good one. And I had some time. I had a little slot of time where I could do it. And uh, already in this month, it's 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 sold. I wonder it may have hit a hundred at this point, which is really good for um, for a first month of a book. So I'm hoping in the long run that one will continue to make money. Um, and uh, and then and then there's the the per finished hour, mm -hmm. uh, which is that's where you get paid. Uh, for the finished amount, not how much you record. And this is the thing that you have to know when doing this is your ratio of work hours to finished hour is very important. And that's where you can really mess yourself up. When, when I started and I had a, even a leg up in a couple of ways, one in that I've been an actor my whole life because bottom line is it's all acting. Um, and so if, you know, I, I didn't have to do extra training for the acting part of it. There's audiobook specific training, um, narration training, because there's definitely some little different things about it. But I had that. I was also really good with software. Um, I've been a computer guy my whole life, really. And I've also done video editing and audio editing prior to this. And that's another part of the industry that a lot of folks stumble on. Um, is learning the tech side yeah, yeah, because so much of this is self. Uh, you have to do it yourself. Um, with audiobooks, you're considered the producer. Now, you don't have to do it all yourself. You can farm out the proofing and editing and mastering, excuse me, to, to someone else. And a lot of people do. And it's actually encouraged if you, especially if you aren't like really good at this and know exactly what you're doing, it's encouraged to farm that out if you can. That costs money, obviously, um, which I'll talk about another, another form of getting paid. There's something that people have been doing that's now become official through ACX, which is, we call it a hybrid deal. They're calling it Royalty Share Plus, which is kind of a dumb name because authors still don't understand what that means. And that's where you, you do the royalty share, but you also get paid a lesser per finished hour rate on top of it to cover your production costs. Um, anyway, uh, even with a decent background in audio production, all that kind of stuff, my first, my first book, I probably was putting in 10 hours to one finished hour. Um, and that's pretty easy to do when you're starting out. Um, even when you get really good at it and i'm i'm really pretty fast now but doing everything that it takes to do an audiobook prep because that's the thing you got to think about everything you know you got to read the book 
So there's that. That's time in itself. Yeah. You're going to be making notes, uh, uh, pronunciations, looking up. If you have to learn some accents or something that you haven't learned before, you know, all that kind of prep work you got to do. Then there's the recording. And recording can take anywhere from one and a half to three hours per finished hour, depending on how good you are, how much you, you know, how cleanly you can read um, or how difficult the book is. A lot of times, if a book is just really difficult and you have to make a lot of character switches and accents and things, you may be stopping a lot more. Um, then there's editing, which can take, you know, two to four to six hours to one hour, to, again, depending on your skill level you know, how you recorded if, you know, if, if, you know, if your pacing was off and you have to do a lot of, you know, tightening or things like that, uh, taking out uh, or lowering breaths, uh, mouth noise, all that kind of stuff. And then the mastering, getting it all uh, mastered to ACX, um, ACX spec. So it can take a lot of hours to get that one finished hour. Mm -hmm. So depending on how efficiently you work, will determine your ROI. You know, if you're making, so $250 is 250 per finished hour is the SAG minimum on ACX. Okay. Diff different publishers may have different deals with SAG um, and at what their minimum rate is. Uh, you don't have to be SAG and you don't, even if you are SAG, this is an interesting thing in this business. Even if you are SAG, which I am, you don't have to do a SAG contract. There is no such thing as non-union audiobook work. I can do any audiobook. Does not matter. It does not have to go under SAG contract. I'm not breaking the rules. The way it works is if you make enough, um, like on, on ACX, if you make 250 uh, minimum per finished hour on a book, you can convert it to a SAG contract. And then... If you're doing it that way and you're doing it totally independently, that means you have to pay the paymaster you have to find and pay a paymaster that then deals with the um, taking out the pension and health and paying that into SAG and your and taxes and all that stuff. So it it's, it's very much running a business, you know. Um, I this book I just did with this publisher that is under SAG contract, but they deal with it all, which is really nice. Um, so, uh, it, it really depends on what, you know, what rates you can garner, um, sort of a lot of people when they're starting out will, will have lower rates. Um, that is a debatable topic in the audiobook world. A lot of people will say, no, you should always doesn't, there is no be, there's no newbie rate. You should always start right at at your SAG rate, you know, uh, so there's a lot of debate about that, whether it's okay for people to charge less. The bottom line is they do. Yeah. And I, I'm okay with people doing whatever they need to do. Uh, from what I've seen, the people that work a lot in audiobooks and make good money aren't, I don't see them being hurt by that. They seem to continue to be working a lot. Um, I do understand that, you know, if a, a lot of people are lo coming in at low rates that that can drive things down. But so far, uh, the industry is only growing. So, um, you know, I, I, I would not tell somebody, oh, you should not charge less than union rates. But it's a good idea to not charge too low. Just because, you know, if you're working at a $50 for finished hour rate, you're literally going to be making, especially when you start out <laughs> under minimum wage for the amount of work you put in. So you really, you got to think about like, okay, what is my time worth? Um, and you know, don't, don't, don't be, unless you just have all the time in the world and this is, you know, no big deal and you have money too, then fine. But um, I would encourage people to, to start off at a decent rate, you know, uh, at least 150. Um, it's also highly encouraged if you don't know what you're doing to farm out your production, you know, farm out your proofing and your editing and, and stuff like that and your mastering, which costs money. That can cost 
anywhere between 25 per finished hour to 100 per finished hour for everything, you know, depending. So you may want to figure out a way to cover those costs and still make a little money. There's all sorts of ways of going about it. And there's a ton of resources um, to learn about this stuff. Um, I can definitely recommend if anybody's interested in this, go to a website called narratorsroadmap.com. And that was created by um, a lovely lady, Karen Commons, who is a longtime narrator. She actually is based uh, outside of Atlanta here. And she is, <laughs> she's really fantastic. She's one of these people, again, that she doesn't charge. She's never charged for any of this. She just likes to help. And so she's created all sorts of resources for um, audiobook narrators who are new to the business and, and uh, established ones as well on how to do it and where to go and, and all the info you need. So narratorsroadmap.com is her site where you can just get all sorts of info on how to do this, where to start, about technique, um, I mean, really every area of the business. Um, there's also several uh, Facebook groups uh, that are really great. I learned a ton from, from some of these groups when I started out just sort of listening, paying attention, searching the group, going back and looking at old threads because everything's been asked already. Um, uh, but there's and tons of YouTube stuff out there. There's just, there's a, a wealth of information available for free online uh, to teach you how to do all of this stuff. Um, and then of course, I, I also recommend, you know, professional coaching. There's a lot of really fantastic coaches. Um, they're all, some of them are like the best audiobook narrators in the world. And it's, you know, it's like being coached by, you know, like Denzel Washington or, you know, Robert De Niro. Uh, it's, it's one of the nice things about this industry too, is that the, the stars of it are very accessible yeah. um, and willing to help. You'll find them jumping into threads online and, and stuff. And, you know, I've met everybody at these conventions and everybody's just fantastic. And you can actually pay to learn from these folks, uh, which I, I recommend as well. So this started off talking about the money, royalty share and per finished hour. Yeah. I think we talked about. And then there's also now the hybrid deal, which on ACX is called royalty share plus, which uh, is, has become very popular for narrators. So if you, or approached about a royalty share, you see one that you want to do, you know, uh, used to be you'd sort of say, hey, could we do this? What about maybe a, a, a little less on the per finished hour rate and the royalty share so I can cover my production costs? Um, now it's official. We're still sort of trying to teach the authors what it is. Um, a lot of times they just think, oh, royalty share plus. It's going to be royalty share, but better uh, you know i don't know they don't realize it means no you're going to actually pay us something um so there's been a lot of expl explaining to the authors what this is now um so that's another way of going about it so now there's sort of three things there's two and then there's the the one in the middle um cool yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome well um i actually have one last primary question because we're already almost out of time <laughs> i i know i want to apologize i mean i guess that's what oh, no, no, it's good. Like you answered. I, I can talk for hours about this stuff, obviously. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was kind of like checking off questions as your answer sort of answered them already. So uh, my question here is just um, because, you know, I was going to ask about like places that actors can go to get advice and you already had talked about that, but um, I don't know whether it covers this, but is there a way that an actor can stand out and build demand for themselves to be, paid at a higher finished hour rate? Like once, once they've gotten samples, they've done it for a bit, um, what are some things that an actor can do to really like stand out and be like, you know, someone who like, oh, I gotta have that actor in for my talk. Any suggestions? Oh boy, I mean, I mean, uh, the bottom line is, you know, be good. I mean, that, that's the first thing, like be a good actor, be a good narrator, know the craft. Um, have good sound and whether that means you know if you do it yourself like really learning how to make it sound good uh, a lot of that also has to do with where you record your space is 
really the most important thing more than, you know, you can have a thousand dollar Neumann, you know, TLM 103, which is a, a standard mic in the business. One of the, you know, big studio mics that everybody loves, you know, it's a thousand dollar mic. If your room does not sound good and is not acoustically treated properly, it's not going to sound good. If you have a really good room, you can have a $40 microphone that will sound good. Um, when I started out, I, my room wasn't fantastic, but I did enough that it sounded good. And I did, I had a $40 used mic I got off eBay and, uh, you know, it, it worked. And a lot of people start off that way. A lot of people start off with relatively inexpensive microphones. Um, so you got to sound good. Bottom line, you got to sound good. And so I, I didn't mention that, but yes, your space. I luckily now in the house I uh, moved into here in Atlanta, discovered I had this five by nine concrete room that's three quarters buried underground <laughs> connected to my basement. So I lucked out on this place uh, and I set up the studio to see, I built all these acoustic panels myself, mm -hmm. um, which is not, expensive to do and they're fantastic this room sounds great i used to work in either my little thing that i had originally created with the folding screens i've also worked out of um and a lot of narrators do this when they're starting even a lot of narrators are still doing this for years is out of closets if you have a big walk-in closet that's a great place to start it needs to be quiet and then you need to have it treated well so sound so it's dead so uh it absorbs you know all the various residencies and you're not getting reflections. Uh, so to stand out, good sound, great acting. It's all about the acting. Um, know the, you know, know the craft, obviously, that sort of goes along with the acting, but there, there are certain differences to narrating than there are to, say, being on stage. Um, you know, the, the ability to switch between the narrator voice and a character voice quickly and distinct distinctly um pacing narration is a slightly slower like i'm i'm talking pretty fast right now this would be way too fast for for an audiobook narration narration you need to be slow and clear and uh and then as far as like once you got all that down and you have you know you're a good narrator um the way to stand out really ends up being like so much so many other businesses is it's marketing it's all about marketing yourself and you know uh, making yourself known uh if you can have something different have something to offer people um if there's you know ways to make to make yourself more than just a, a great audiobook narrator uh, you know if you can help authors i think and that's the, uh, another big part of this with uh, narrators is you go out you find authors you know, you can, you can find a good author that has books that you're interested in that don't have audiobooks and say, hey, I can help you bring this to audiobook. Let's talk. That's the way a, a lot of people really make their money. It's not even like auditioning for stuff on their own. They go find the books. They find the authors. You um, go to book conventions. Go speak at your local, like if there's like book clubs and, and, or authors groups that meet. Find them, ask them if you can go present, you know, give a presentation about how to turn their books into audiobooks. Um, there's tons of, you know, online marketing uh, as far as, you know, a lot of social media stuff. Um, uh, a lot of narrators have an online presence, um, you know, business pages specifically for their, their, na their narration. Uh, they'll post videos of themselves doing you know, working on a book or they'll have live Q and A's with, with, you know, with listeners, uh, things like that. Um, there's a whole range of ways to sort of get yourself out there, but um, you need to get yourself out there to the listeners and you need to get, uh, get yourself known in the industry is another thing, um, which is not terribly difficult as long as, you know, be nice, be helpful, uh, be active in the groups like the Facebook groups and, and, and uh, go, to the, go to the conventions. I just uh, 
a couple months back in May, went to the Audio Publishers Association Convention, the APA. Um, you can Anybody can join that. It's not terribly expensive for a membership. That has tons of resources as well. And they have events throughout the year. Um, especially if you live in Los Angeles or New York, they have live events you can attend. Um, and then also every year they have the Audio Publishers Association Convention, APAC. And I just went to that. And that's a huge thing. Um, if you're going to be an audiobook narrator, you, it's something you're going to want to do uh, at some point. That going there was the reason I ended up getting this book with this publisher because I met them there. All the publishers go. Um, that's sort of the what it's about. It's you go and you, you can meet all these publishers. Uh, they have various ways you can meet them as well. There's a lot of social activities. Um, but yeah, you kind of, you want to get your name out into the, into the community, into the business community of audiobooks with other narrators and the publishers. If they know you and they know your name, you know, that's, that's really, it's the same way in on camera. It's being top of mind with people so that when they have that book that they need that voice, they go, oh, oh, hey, oh yeah, you know, I've been meaning to talk to that person. Mm -hmm. Let me give him a call. Um, it's, it's about, you know, it's, it's, it's about visibility. And that's, that's part of this that is, has been the biggest challenge, which it usually is for a lot of performers. It always was for me and on camera. That was the side, the business side of things. I just did not want to do. I'm like, why can't I just act, please? I'm just an actor. But you, you know, it's, you have to do it. You have to market. And uh, I, I really fought that in on camera. And for whatever reason, um, I'm having more fun with it in the audiobook world and in voiceover in general, but it's a lot of work. And I'm still like just scratching the surface with it. Um, and it's really sort of the thing I need to kick into gear more. I've been working a lot, which is great, um, but I need to schedule my time so that I can really spend some time focusing on the marketing. Um, and the best, mar uh, the best narrators out there that are working a lot, you, you'll see them frequently. They, are, they always have updates and posts and articles that they're sharing or videos and all sorts of stuff. But you know, you gotta be consistently out in the world and on people's minds and, and, you know, finding the work and finding the connections. That's really the, the main thing. If you just sit back and go either sit back thinking, oh, I'll wait for people to come to me, not going to happen. Or even like, I'm just going to audition. That's very difficult. You're not going to make a living at this by just auditioning on ACX. It's just, there's not enough, especially the paying work. Unfortunately on ACX, you can uh, search for uh, titles also based on what they're paying and royalty share thousands and thousands when you start getting even into the you know 100 to 200 dollar per finished hour range that shrinks i mean tremendously there might be 20 of those at any given time maybe and then when you get up into the sag rates the 200 to 400 range often there's maybe a few and when you think about that there's thousands of narrators on that site all of them are auditioning for those and the best ones are auditioning for those so you have to you have to make work because you can't just get it by just auditioning you have to go find it makes sense well this was amazing i really appreciate you uh chatting a lot about all of this stuff um now, I wish that we could talk about it more. Perhaps uh, I'll probably re be writing some sort of article or two down the line. I'll probably reach out to you for you know some quotes and info. Um, maybe I'll even reach out to uh, the person in charge of the narrator's roadmap website. Um, that might sure. be an interesting interview to do. Karen's but fantastic, it's yeah. It's amazing. The stuff that you talked about here, um, especially towards the end when we started talking about the marketing ideas and how you can go out of the traditional path. And that's kind of a principle that I teach actors in general through my website is, you know, yes, you can go on to places like Actors Access to get work, 
And yes, you can, you know, continuously try to network with like casting directors and stuff, but that's what everybody's doing. Yeah. So there's other ways to go around it and create your own work and create demand for yourself that not as many people are doing. And those are the things that will really get you to stand out. Yep, um, absolutely. This was, this was awesome. I can't thank you enough. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to staying in touch with this stuff. All right. Thanks for having me. All right.